So then we have the fourth generational type that comes along, and this is the one that's coming of age now. It's, we, we refer to it as a civic generation. Uh, originally, as Morley mentioned, the last previous incarnation of this generation was the GI generation. That was a generation born from 1901 to, to, to 1924, and the millennials 1982 to 2003. They are protected and revered as children. Basically, all of these boomer parents, and in particular Gen X parents who were kind of left to fend for themselves as kids, said that isn't the way I like to raise kids. Kids shouldn't be raised like that. They should be protected. They should be revered. We all want to have children now. If you think of some pop culture kinds of things, uh, it was people who were going from singles bars to suddenly becoming wonderful parents. Children redeemed their lives. So two and two, three men and a baby, uh, you know, these dissolute boomer men who suddenly find a child come into their life and it completely changes everything. Whole different attitude toward children. And uh, uh, the baby on board side was the sign that came along to talk about how we felt about children with this particular generation. So you might recognize these folks. This is the Keaton family from, uh, from, from that particular sitcom. Mother and father were two baby boomer flower children. They were liberal Democrats. And somehow their son came along, Alex P. Keaton, Michael J. Fox. He wasn't a liberal Democrat. He was a conservative Republican. He idolized Nixon. He idolized Ronald Reagan. Uh, his first romantic love affair was with a woman, another a, a woman, and they rhapsodized about Milton Friedman's economic theories. So this was the rebellion. But he was a nice young man. He didn't. He just was different than his parents. Their daughter was a clothes horse. She all she wanted to do was spend time in the mall. But these were both Gen Xers, and she became an entrepreneur. She started a. She became a fashion designer, so that was typical Gen X format. The younger children were closer, they were millennials, and so they resisted Alex P. Keaton's attempts to turn them into conservative Republicans. They were just a very different kind of generation, but they were polite about it. Probably the best example of how millennial children were reared were the Huxtable family from the Bill Cosby show. Both parents were working. Both parents had professional jobs, but they had lots of time for their kids. Raising their kids was very important to them. The kids were given rules, but they negotiated the punishments with their parents. They were good millennial kids, and so they, 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 the, the, the kids were, were, were given a sense of nurturing, but also the ability to, to, to negotiate things with their parents. Uh, they never left home throughout this entire series. But no matter how Bill Cosby, much Bill Cosby, wanted to have the house to himself, the kids were always coming back. But they were always welcome back, too. So what you end up having is this is a group of people, uh, who, as, they, as they age, as they become adults, they become very group-oriented. You, you think about all the kids in the Cosby show always having lots of people around them. They weren't alienated. They weren't isolated, not like the, the, the Bundy kids in Married with Children. They had lots of friends around them friends of all ethnic groups, friends of all kinds of social backgrounds. They resolved issues, they tried to work out their problems, and that's the kind of generation that has been raised, and that's the kind of generation that's going to be taking over in America in the very near future. So depending on which type of generation realigns the American political process, we have two types of realignments. Realignments are caused either by an ide idealist generation or a civic generation and they alternate. So our first realignment was produced by a, an idealist president, Andrew Jackson. And think about what was going on right before the Civil War. We had the great moral issue of slavery. The country could never figure out a way of resolving that issue. It, and, and if you think about it, there was you know, the huge division, both sides, strong moral positions. It was, you know, on the southern side, it was, it was, it was an ordained by God. On the northern side, the end of slavery was ordained by God. Neither side could figure out any way of compromising on that particular issue. And so it took a civic generation, a civic president, Abraham Lincoln, to end this, gener to end this conflict eventually, to resolve that horrible issue. 
The next realignment was, again, another idealist era, and it brought about a lot of the things that we've seen very, that seem, might seem very familiar, economic inequality, and we'll talk, Morley will talk about that in a little while, things of that nature. Emphasis on social issues. We, I think, when we were all growing up, we thought that there could never be any discussion again of evolution. It just seemed like a, a, a completely settled issue. But in the 1920s, there was huge discussion of evolution, and it's come about even in the most recent era. 1932, FDR brought about a civic realignment, and in 1968, the election of Richard Nixon, another idealist era. So we are now on the verge of another civic era. And as I mentioned, 1968 came, came as a, about the realignment as a result of the emergence of an idealist generation, the baby boomers who tried to implement their own personal morality through the political process through the political institutions, and the end result was atrophy of political institutions and, and um, a, a uh, 40 years of gridlock. And that's reflected in a lot of different ways. One thing that happens in civic, I'm sorry, in idealist eras, is that there is a huge increase in the number of people who call themselves political independents because people don't like the institutions. They can't identify with a political party. They don't feel comfortable with it because they don't think the political parties are particularly effective. So in the 1930s through the 1950s, when the, when the civic generation, the GI generation was dominating things, only about a quarter of the electorate thought of themselves as independents. By the 1970s through the 1990s, that number had gone up to 40%. It's going down, it's closer to 30 or 35% now. So as we go into a civic era, we're seeing more people identify as parties, fewer with parties, fewer as independents. In the idealist eras, there are huge numbers of split ticket voting cast. People say they vote for the candidate, not the party, because they, again, don't trust the parties. So they pick and choose, try to find individual candidates to vote for. 1956, when Eisenhower defeated Stevenson, a uh, landslide election, only a third of the votes cast were split ticket votes. By 1972, when another landslide election, another Republican won a huge victory, Nixon over McGovern, two thirds were split ticket votes. So even though Nixon may have won the election, a lot of people were still voting Democratic. 